This is the story of how Simon Armitage caught it in the neck from the Green Knight at the International Medieval Congress at Leeds University in 2014 because of his vain and discourteous so-called translation of the great 14th century poem Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. The tale will be told in loyally locked words and pictures. The Green Knight which confronted Mr Armitage at Leeds has been abroad in the land for some years in the company of his squire, guardian and interpreter, as I might call myself. And as a figure of the Green Man and other forces, he has been about for centuries and even millennia. Mr. Armitage's translation of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight had been published by Messrs. Faber and Faber in 2007. The blurb, and Mr. Armitage's introduction to his work, and the translation itself had both amused and appalled me. A reading of the first ten pieces of the poem, as far as line 231, was enough to convince me of the foolishness of Mr Armitage's venture. It is in the tenth piece, lines 203 to 231, where he suggests, amongst many other absurdities, that the Green Knight entering the hall at Camelot held in one hand a sprig of holly that Mr Armitage simply shows his unworthiness for the task. This insult to a wonderful poem, and to its unknown author and his magnificent creation, The Green Knight, got me up into the saddle. I made some notes for what might eventually be a critical review of a translation that was clearly silly, poor and unmannerly. Then set about re-examining the poem and preparing to make my own translation of it. Forty years after making a brief start on such a venture. The work of doing so, and then of recording the whole poem in Middle English and in translation, and then, because I found my first efforts most inadequate, doing it all again took me three years. But even as I set out on this adventure in 2007, Mr Armitage happened to come to Manchester to give a presentation on some other work of his. I attended, and was able to catch him on his own by a table of his books, I think, before he went down to the lecture theatre at the Metropolitan University, as it then was. I went up to him and introduced myself by name. I said that he had made a bold attempt at a translation of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, but that he had fallen short in many respects. Then I took a sprig of holly from the inside pocket of my jacket, gave it to him with a little bow, and left. Game on. In translation, and in the original Middle English, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight takes over three hours to read aloud or recite in a measured way. After recording the poem in both versions, I went on to produce a telling of the story which, with some music and an interval, takes two hours. This was produced originally for performance in Macclesfield as a part of the Barnaby Festival of 2011. The Green Knight puppet, created by Jackie Clark, was in the street parade on his horse with axe and a large wreath of holly about which more later, all supported on a supermarket trolley, which arrangement was thought up inspirationally by John Hartshorn, the principal parade coordinator. It rained heavily throughout the parade, as this lens-spattered camera shot taken before we set off shows. But the Green Knight survived intact, and has since continued his adventures. When the Gawain story was presented at St Peter's College, Oxford, he presided in the pulpit of the chapel. 
I might say that since appearing at such an august and intellectually testing venue, he has had some brain surgery performed, and he is now something of an egghead. This is all part of my work as a poetician, dealing with medieval poetry generally, and indeed with all English poetry, in structure and performance. In 2013, I was at the Leeds International Medieval Congress to present a paper on metre and rhythm in medieval verse and to give two performances. The first of these performances expanded on material in the paper, which was titled On the Especial Metrical Pleasures of Medieval Verse. It was called Tongue, Tone, Tune and Time. I began the show dressed in a white lab coat as a metrical scientist, Dr. Mervyn Acorn, and ended, at the audience's request, with performance of the Old English Wanderer from the Exeter book, both in translation and in the original language. The second performance was of the early 14th century Sir Orfeo, This was part of a new venture on the last day of the Congress, called Making Leeds Medieval. For this I was able to get together with members of the Leeds Waits musicians. I had a paper accepted for the 2014 Congress, and was hoping that it might again be possible to give some sort of presentations or performances amplifying the theory of metre and rhythm that I would be outlining in the paper. When the Congress Handbook arrived in March, I found my paper listed. Then I saw that Mr Armitage was also coming to the Congress to give a presentation on his version of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight and other work on which he was engaged. This necessitated action. I set about writing the critical assessment of his translation of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight that I had begun seven years before. This took a considerable time to draft and refine. It then went onto my website as a document to be made active when the Congress began in July. It was of over fifty handwritten A4 pages which were scanned in. At the same time as I was writing the essay, the Green Knight puppet had to be refurbished and freshly dressed. Also, a flyer was got up, in two versions, the first was of two A5 sides and the other of four. This story will now be told mostly through photographs taken by my companion and shield maiden, Dorley Nauter, who may be seen in this selfie sporting our green, red and gold favour. We begin at Dawley's house in Bowdoin, Cheshire, on the morning of Monday, July the 7th, 2014. Less than a mile hence, incidentally, there is the site of a now disappeared medieval castle. The Green Knight lives in Dawley's basement when awaiting performances and adventures. As was noted before, he was made by Jackie Clark, Dawley's stepdaughter, who is an artist, photographer, horsewoman and sailor. Here in Bowdoin, the Green Knight's axe is receiving some decorative tasseling. Triad Tasseles, as it says in line 219 of the original poem. With Triad Tasseles thereto tached in och. These go on to the axe handle, which has fine green patterning, as line 216 says. And I'll be graven with grain in gracious workes. That first line, 219, translates as with well-tried tasseling thereto attached in plenty. Mr. Armitage has provided us with the absurd line trimmed with tassels and tails of string, which is ignoble nonsense. 
But let us go back a little to his earlier description of what the Green Knight holds in his hands when he enters the hall at Camelot. In the original text we have this. But in his own hand he had a hollin bob, that is gratis in grain when a grave is arbar, and an axe in his other a hodge and on meta, a spit us a sparther to expone in spell whoso michte. This may be closely and simply translated as but in his one hand he was holding a holly bunch there, that is the greatest in green when the groves are all bare, and an axe in the other, a huge, an immense one, a terrible tool to treat of in talk who so might. Mr. Armitage gives us this travesty. But held in one hand a sprig of holly, of all the evergreens the greenest ever, and in the other hand held the mother of all axes, a cruel piece of kit, I kid you not. A sprig of holly as on a Christmas pudding, a muddle of evergreens, an axe out of a comic book. It is a risible mess. It was this farrago in particular that led eventually to the Green Knight's journey to Leeds to, shall we say, finger Mr. Armitage's collar. So the axe was receiving special green and gold attention. Note the new Timex Expedition watch, which replaces one lost after a game of five-a-side football in Knutsford a few weeks before. The Green Knight, or Bert, with axe and hollin bobber, was stowed away in my exceptionally well-cleaned-for-the-occasion Gardencraft white van for his trip over the Pennines for this away fixture. Dawley was especially pleased that the van did not on this occasion smell so pungently of petrol mowers and rotting grass. The hollin bobber, or branch, or bunch, or gathering of holly, had been taken, by kind permission of the owners, from a garden that I keep in Ollerton. At Leeds the green night was expected. We were soon part of the show. The game had begun. The Congress Committee had invited the Green Knight to take part in the Making Leeds Medieval events on the final day. I had been kindly allowed to present a reading from Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, and the Green Knight was to process through the University Square beforehand. Now I had said that I might bring him on the first day, without explaining that I hoped that he might be able to speak to Simon Armitage that evening. In addition to my paper and the Gawain presentation, I was also giving a performance of medieval verse on the Wednesday. My Monday paper had been left as the only one in its session, and I was told that I could hold my ground there rather than join another, perhaps ill-suited, session which I did. A moderator had been found for me, with whom I was already acquainted, Dr. Alaric Hall of Leeds. The session was very well attended, and I was able to extend my presentation, speaking, reciting, and playing the Sutton Who Liar. Then Bert, Sir Bertilak, was released from the van and set up in the visitor car park about 200 yards from the workshop theatre where Simon Armitage was to appear. Bert had been provided with new shoulders for the occasion, which were fashioned from some plastic guttering, bits of plastic bottles and such, and he had a verdant new green and gold jacket or straight coat. When his assembly was complete, we got on our way to the theatre. Our presence outside the theatre to greet all those entering may become the stuff of myth and legend, if YouTube does myths and legends. 
We had asked to have seats for the performance, and when all were in the theatre, we were urgently called up. Permission was kindly given for Bert, with Axe and Holly, to be brought into the building. So he was set up in the foyer facing the entrance. We took the seats kindly provided for us in the front row, and found that chairs were then placed in front of us, to be taken in due course by the man himself and a companion before he was introduced to the audience. So, on his entry to the building, Mr. Armitage had been confronted by the Green Knight. But did he know who was sitting behind him now? In his hour-long presentation, Mr. Armitage rolled out his practised and familiar tropes regarding his translation of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. He spoke about bringing the poem home, and of what he himself terms the preposterous conviction that grew on him that he was, as he says, put on this planet for no other reason than to translate this poem. And, of course, he told us about his early visit to the British Library in the expectation of seeing the precious original manuscript of the poem, only to be somewhat embarrassingly rebuffed. On this occasion at Leeds, he further egged his pudding with a reference to scholarly eggheads at the British Library reading room looking askance at him which was an interesting comment to make in the present circumstance of his appearance at the International Medieval Congress. He also told us, of course, of his visit to a deer farm to see the butchering of a deer in his search for authenticity. This was interesting. For he mentioned also on this occasion the Green Knight's reddened eyes, which had, of course, assessed him as he entered the building. And he also made the admission that he now regarded his Gawain as a version rather than a translation. Could it be that this proud knight is on the way to acknowledging some sort of fault? When it was clear that there was to be no opportunity for questions, we were first out, and the Green Knight was set up outside again. As the audience emerged, the two-page flyer with its link to the essay was handed out. Then there was a long wait in the dry but quite cool evening air. A strange tower glowed in the late sunlight. Perhaps it was known that we were there. Or perhaps it was thought that we had gone and Simon Armitage was only chatting and signing books. But when he did finally emerge, in the company of a couple of others, I said to him, Good evening, Mr. Armitage. To his credit, he played the game, though perhaps he was in a presence so strong that he could do nothing else and he began taking pictures on his phone. Then Dawley gave him a flyer, which prompted further activity from him. Then I said, Mr. Armitage, may the Green Knight ask a question? He assented. I said, he would, amongst many other things, like to know why, in your telling of his story, you gave him such a silly and insignificant sprig of holly? With a shrug, he replied, Perhaps it was because I couldn't find another word to alliterate with holly. Then he went on immediately to add, But I did put in hollin later. I said, But you had already blown it, Mr. Armitage. Go to the link on the flyer and meet your destiny. He boldly took more pictures and then left. 
perhaps not headless, but definitely nicked. After this, we were kindly allowed to take the Green Knight up into the Congress office in the Parkinson building, to lodge there until the Thursday. On that day, none of the thunderbolts predicted by the meteorological office ensued when, led by musicians and with attendants carrying his axe and holly bunch, the Green Knight processed through the university campus to the Union foyer, where I presented some of the story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight in the original language and in a true translation of my own. So there it is, the story of how Simon Armitage was nicked by the Green Knight. And if you think that it was rather much of a fuss about a mere sprig of holly, then do read my critical essay, which is even more fussy, furious and far-reaching. <laughs>